Hey, this is Patrick from LSAT Lab. Let's work on reading comp, specifically questions that deal with the author's intent. In our first couple videos, we worked on our big picture reading skills, essentially briefing the case when we see a passage. And now we're moving on to videos about specific clusters of question types. And today's cluster is all about what the author's meaning or rhetorical purpose was in a certain paragraph, a certain detail, or a certain phrase. We're always using these same three tests LSAC lets us use, and they're available on our website if you want to pop open a new tab so that you can have your own copy to read off of. All right, let's dig into authors. Who are you guys? Can I help you with something? Oh, uh, isn't this lesson about author's intents? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Not a great start. <laughs> ma'am, ma'am, your manuscript is headed for the fire. Do you have a copy on a floppy disk? So we're going to be asked about, you know, what was the author intending to do with this paragraph? What was the author intending to do with this detail? Or what was the author intending to mean with this phrase or this word? Let's get used to some of the question stems. Paragraph purpose, we'll have words like paragraph and purpose. Maybe the relationship between paragraphs or the function of a paragraph. Since it's asking us about purpose and function, we know to connect it to the big picture. And since it's saying what's the primary, the most accurate, an answer could be true but wrong because it's not the main thing. Local purpose is asking us about the reason an author included a certain detail. Why did she talk about damaged ecological systems or Dove's experience in Germany? So we can see a lot of these are saying the primary purpose of this detail was to do what? All of these question stems will have a specific detail and then a phrase that sounds like it was in order to do what? Meaning in context is even more granular. It's saying, what was this phrase referring to? The state's chip? What did the word strengthen mean? Or what was the author referring to when she said existing generic parameters? Notice that they all have a phrase that means in context, as the author intended to use this. There's technically two different styles. One of them is asking you which answer choice is basically a synonym for the same word. And then the other one is saying, when the author used this phrase, what was she referring to? What earlier point in the passage is this a callback to? We'll get into these two styles later, but overall, there are your three author's intent questions. We're not in the tent, we're on the tent. Cool. Your three author's intent questions. Are you happy? No, I'm never happy. Nor am I. Perhaps that's why we write. Mmm, yes, of course. Okay, guys, we're gonna read some passages now, so let's get into our happy place for reading. Did you know that this might be the only life we get to live? Man, every second is so precious then, right? And every second is precious on the LSAT, but we slow down during the first paragraph to settle on the central topic, to try to pick a big picture framework so there's really only two or three big ideas we care about, and to listen for whether the author's voice came through or whether there was a special pivot moment. So quiet your heart and silence your phone, and let's sink deep into this treasure of a passage. Ooh, but not so deep that you go down the drain. Forgot to warn you about that. Sir, you are my new protagonist. Okay, pause the video and give yourself about three minutes to read through this passage, and then unpause when you're done. Welcome back. Let's do this first paragraph. Got to settle on our central topic, which is normally in the first sentence. This first sentence, like a lot of passages, is pretty dense and hard to get on the first read. So we want to break it down into bite-sized pieces, get a mental picture. A critic of advertising. What do they look like? What do they sound like? You've ruined Christmas. Now you've ruined autumn. Great, thanks for ruining Fridays. Okay, I can see his crotchety face. Now I need false needs. What are false needs? Do you need collectible stamps? I need collectible stamps. Do you need a thermometer that can also keep track of your blood pressure? I need a thermometer that can also keep track of my blood pressure. Okay, I got false needs. The principal mechanism underlying it's manipulative and hegemonic. That's not a familiar word, but manipulative is, so let's lean on that one. We've got people who are criticizing advertising by saying you are manipulating us into having false needs. All right, we need a framework for organizing the big picture. 
So we're really looking for clues early on, and a sentence that starts with an attribution, like some critics have assumed, seems to suggest that we'll challenge that position or replace it with a new one or, you know, set up a debate. As we continue through the paragraph, though, we're still in that position's mindset. So there isn't any pivot or author's voice in the first paragraph. Okay, I don't really know what my framework should be then yet. Maybe highlight noteworthy? We're just describing stuff so far. The second paragraph, pivot? Marcuse, no, we're still in that first paragraph point of view. Where's my pivot? Everything in this paragraph is just still explaining Marcuse's worldview. All right, so at this stage, I'd have to think it's a highlight noteworthy about Marcuse's worldview. But then, what's this? Zig, zag. Uh-huh. Now the pivot dancers are on holiday. Well, COVID protocol. We didn't get our butt yet, however, pivot, but we got an attitude indicator, an opinion indicator. A lot of times those are gonna be adverbs, like unfortunately, regrettably, conveniently. Those can also indicate when the author's voice finally enters center stage. So at this moment we realize this is a challenge position passage. Our author is arriving on the scene to push back against the point of view that we saw in the first two paragraphs. Main point, Marcusians are dumb. Now I need to flesh that out, but I wanna prep my big picture. They think advertising manipulates us into having false needs, and our author's gonna say, no it doesn't. As we continue into this third paragraph, our author is saying, how can you tell a real need from a false need? And then her main point seems to be like, we're adults, guys. We understand that advertisers are trying to brainwash us. We're not just passively taking it in. We buy a product knowing it's not gonna give us what was promised in the ads. So our author really has two pushbacks. You know, if we're brainwashed, how would you know a real need from a false need? We are more savvy and smart about this than you think. Now let's pause the video and try this paragraph purpose question. Unpause when you're done and then we'll discuss. Welcome back. For each of these question types, we want to think about, should I be looking back at the passage first? Can I comprehend it well enough to say it in my own words? And can I predict what a correct answer should sound like? To put it another way, what, if anything, should I research? What do I need to comprehend in order to get this right? And can I anticipate what a correct answer should look like? When it comes to paragraph purpose, the thing we're looking for would be like a rhetorical marker something that would give us an easy sense of how a paragraph is designed to function. Pause the recording and read this paragraph. So the most important word in that first sentence is the also. Words like also, moreover, furthermore, mean that you're getting a new premise for the same bigger point. So when we see that also, we're going, okay, this paragraph adds on to the functionality of the previous one, we're still talking about how her Texas upbringing is reflected in her poetry. Words like for example, first, second, indicate lists, and those mean that the big idea is what came right before it. When we see a for example, we rewind and think, all right, that first sentence is the purpose of the paragraph. We're trying to unpack that idea. Some other common purposes, You'll see like a but yet however to mean that this new paragraph is going against the previous one. You'll see a lot of last paragraphs get tested where the author is talking about the implications of this new science or her recommendation for this problem. Second paragraphs a lot of times if they just start off sounding informative are really just giving you some background info. All right, we're looking for rhetorical signposts. We see that there's an attribution and then another attribution to Marcuse and then kind of just a causal claim. So what's noteworthy is there isn't any author stuff. We're just presenting someone else's point of view. Let's think about how this relates to our passage map overall. We thought that the first paragraph sort of gave us an overview of the Marcusian point of view. Second paragraph dug into the false needs. And then in the third paragraph, the author starts to challenge it. So let's try to find an answer that aligns with the overview of the position the author's challenging. A looks pretty good. The gist is saying that we're summarizing Marcuse, 
but the details don't all add up. We do have support for economic context, but we don't have anything for political. So A, you got served. B is saying that we're talking about false needs, which we do, but that's more about the second paragraph. We want to be sensitive to a wrong paragraph trap answer. Serena? Nice serve. C says that we're evaluating psychological processes. That verb evaluate means the author is offering her opinion. But we determined, no, 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 there's no author voice in the first paragraph. This is all someone else. So evaluate is enough to kill that one. D also has the right gist. We're describing the Marcusian views. But again, the details kill it. Prevailing is a loaded term that means the mainstream view. And the view is identified as some critics of advertising. So there's no way to call it the prevailing view. E ends up being matchable. We do describe Marcusian views in the second and third sentence. And we do indicate their role by saying they're central to the type of critique that was mentioned in the first sentence. E doesn't mention anything about this is a view that will be challenged later, but it doesn't say anything incorrect, and the others all did, so it becomes our best available answer. So we're looking for rhetorical markers. We're thinking about our passage map. We care more about accuracy than about our prediction, but if we have two accurate answers, we'll let the big picture break the tie. Let's look at a meaning and context question from the same passage. The question is asking about something in the third paragraph, but when they say what does it refer to, it could involve earlier stuff. So we're showing you some of the earlier paragraphs if you need it. Pause the video and try it out. Welcome back. Hey, this is a question we call meaning and context. Hey, I was kind of hoping to enjoy the silence if that's okay. So there are two different meaning and context question types. The one we tried was asking what does this phrase refer to? Helga, I got it, but thank you. So there's a type of meaning and context where they ask you what a word or phrase refers to, and there's a kind where they ask you which answer choice could be substituted for a word where it would basically mean the same thing. We tried one of the first kind, so when it comes to researching the passage, they're going to light up the word and highlight it for us. But we need to comprehend what this word refers to, and we may have to trace it back to an earlier paragraph. Can we just bust out our control F and say, show me forces? Well, it wouldn't have shown up here. What if we said, show me persuasion? That also was not a word used. No, oh, no, they're using synonyms. I feel lost and alone. So if our comprehension is strong, we know that forces of persuasion is just a reference to advertising. But otherwise, we're going to have to dig it out of the context. It's something that prevents us from understanding real versus false. And it's so prevalent, it informs our instincts. How do we match that up with advertising? Well, they say it's prevalent. It's in mass market culture. It's got powerful psychological techniques. So it's switching our instinctive judgments. They're manipulating us into having these false needs. Once we figure out what the author was referring to, let's stay steadfast. Plant your feet in the ground. That expression meant the powerful psychological techniques of advertising. Or if you want to simplify, that expression was referring to advertising. Dishonest claims in advertising. A, you can stick around. Innate, instinctual drives of human behavior? No, that's not advertising. Emotional pressures by society? Not advertising. The subtle practices sponsored by the state? Not advertising. A manipulative influence that goes unrecognized? I mean, that could apply to advertising. So we got to dig into A versus E. Were the advertisers intentionally lying to us? I mean, we were told that they're using powerful psychological techniques to create false needs, but it meant like a perfume ad that hints that sex and perfume are somehow related and brainwashes you into having a false need for perfume. They didn't lie, though. They don't actually say, you need perfume for sex. Manipulative influence better matches a psychological technique that's brainwashing you. Did theorists say that, hey, we don't even recognize we're being brainwashed? They talk about us sort of deluding ourselves into thinking that products satisfy ourselves. And then they talk about the idea that we can't even tell our real needs from our false needs anymore because advertising has come to inform our instinctive judgment. The first half of E has better support than A because we see manipulative multiple times. And the second half of E is 
doable. We are believing we're satisfied in spite of the opposite. We can't tell our real needs from our false needs. So yeah, there's some unrecognized brainwashing. Our correct answer is intentionally tricky by not using the word advertising, just using expressions that could refer to it. So that was the what does this refer to meaning in context question. What did you think? I didn't love it. Can I try the substitution type? Of course. We offer that treatment too. A surcharge will apply. Oh, no you don't. I got a 1015 mm. with Dolores. Hey. Hey Dolores, how are your cats? Oh, I have parrots and they're fine. Well, actually, Corky's seen better days. He's got something on his wing. We're hoping it's just avian warts. Ugh. Well, can I get one of those substitution questions? And if possible, can you explain to me what the internet is? You got it, Mr. Barnaby. Okay, let's pause the video, say a little prayer for Corky, and try this problem. Welcome back. We're going to look, starting from the previous sentence, to get a general feel for what we were talking about and try to come up with our own synonym for the word we're replacing. The correct answer usually leans on language before or after that sentence, and the trap answers just deal with your dictionary definition of the word. We need to figure out what the context was, so we'll start from the previous sentence and then come up with our own word that would work for strengthened. So the previous sentence is dense. I would probably subtract all that filler in the middle, it's saying that the internet is raising legal issues for people that post their documents. Their intellectual property rights are in question. They're saying that like, if you don't strengthen copyright law, then our documents aren't protected from infringement. So strengthening copyright law means to better protect their documents from being infringed on. All right, we're gonna to try to find an answer that essentially plays that role. If copyright law is made more restrictive, it better protects their rights. If it's made the same worldwide, that doesn't like improve its ability to protect them if it's currently not good. Harsher penalties, better enforced, that could better protect their rights. More recognized as legitimate doesn't have anything to do with better protecting their rights. So how are we gonna pick among these three? We wanna look at the bookend sentences for other language cues. The sentence after is saying, web users are like, no, don't strengthen copyright law. That'll reduce our ability to access information. So which of these answers sounds the most like reducing access? More restrictions. Thus, A is our correct answer. That was delicious. You passed out for three hours, so I have to charge you for five appointments. What? No, I'm in the Medicare donut hole. How did they make each of these types challenging? In the refers to example, they didn't actually say advertising. They used cryptic phrases that refer to it. And in the substitution example, the actual answer sounds nothing like your dictionary definition of strengthening. All right, for the sake of our next question, let's go ahead and read the rest of that passage we were just starting. Pause the video and unpause when you're done. When we picked A on that last question, we were supporting it from the first paragraph where it says, if you reduce our ability to access pages. You may have noticed as you read the rest of the passage, there is also language like restricting access and impeding the free exchange of ideas that also helps support that answer. Let's try a new question type. Pause the video and give this one a try. This question type is pretty common and it actually has a very fun formula to it. We call it local purpose. You identify it by seeing in the question stem some infinitive in order to do this, primarily to do that. Infinitives convey purpose. So if we wrote a sentence describing this situation and said, she drove through the puddle, comma, splashing me, that just speaks to the result. But if we say she drove through to splash me, that speaks to her intent. It felt personal. To figure out why something's happening, you often need a wider lens. So you wanna zoom out on local purpose questions to see what's really going on. This may look like a kid's magic show, not like the murder trial it is. You may think that this woman's gardening and not helping out a friend. So the secret trick to local purpose is that when we look back at the text, we actually wanna look at the sentence right before, a framing idea that comes right before it, or a takeaway that follows it. 
We'll often want to remind ourselves of the overall purpose of that paragraph, but we don't need to go beyond that. When we see answer machines shows up here in the second sentence, we want to resist the urge of caring about that sentence. We want to care about what came before or after. We're trying to answer some question, so let's roll back one more sentence. The question is, if I link to a document that's on your page, am I infringing on your rights? And the author thinks, well, to determine that, we got to figure out who controls that document. So the setup for this answering machine conversation is who controls a document that's posted online. The author uses the answering machine as an analogy. She's saying it's comparable or akin to this sort of situation we're looking at online. And she's saying, if I give Kevin your phone number and say, you got to hear this person's voicemail, I'm not stealing your voicemail. And if I link Kevin to your document, I'm not stealing your document. You still control access to it. You're the one that controls distribution, so it's not infringement if I link Kevin to your document. Let's recap. On local purpose, they'll highlight a detail, but we don't really want to read the detail sentences. We care about the bookend ideas, usually the setup right before it. You read one or two claims before to get the context, and that might be enough. In this case, we also needed the context after because these takeaways are still related to the discussion of answering machines. Our prephrase should sound like the framing idea or the takeaway. We were trying to make a determination to answer a question. Let's try to look for something like that. A is saying that we're comparing and contrasting legal problems with the phone to legal problems with the internet, but there were no legal problems with the phone. B is saying that we were providing an analogy. Well, that's definitely true. The phone was supposed to be analogous. Giving someone your phone number so you can hear a voicemail is just as harmless as linking to a page so they can read the document on that page. That analogy is meant to show that linking is not infringement. It's not illustrating two positions in the copyright debate. Just like choice A, C is talking about legal problems, but the answering machines had no legal problems, so that's not why we talked about them. D is pretty lovable. It's got the determination, answering a question, the outcome of a debate. This basic principle thing's a little weird. Maybe we could match it with crucial point. Let's hold on to it and come back. E is talking about the phone raises concerns about infringement. But we know the phone was brought up as a case where it's not infringement. It's harmless to give someone a phone number so that you can hear the voicemail recording. So E is out. Looks like D really is our answer. Illustrate is a very common verb for local purpose. The point of bringing up a detail is usually to illustrate a broader point, so you get used to the idea that this is pointing to the idea right before. And if we compare language in D to that sentence before, you see a lot of resonance. Pause the video and try one more of these local purpose questions. Look for that framing idea earlier than the detail. Welcome back. The primary purpose and the two tells us we're doing local purpose. So we think this question's really testing me on what came before Germany or what comes right after it. But there really is no after here because the next paragraph is what's after. So we'd focus on what's the framing idea that came before Germany. If we reread the previous sentence, it actually doesn't sound like a framing idea. It just sounds like a detail about her upbringing. The also is telling us these two sentences work together. They're collectively supporting a framing idea before them. So the previous sentence gives us this idea that Dove was incredulous that we like to segregate poetry and fiction. She didn't realize it was so dangerous to mix the two. Apparently in America, there's a bias against writers who try to go from one genre to the other, whereas in Germany, they wouldn't understand our restrictiveness. Our restrictiveness refers to, you're restricted from mixing the two genres. They must be segregated. Don't cross the line. This whole paragraph is about don't let the genre of poetry and fiction overlap. Dove finds that weird because she grew up reading both of them and then she spent time in Germany and they didn't act there like you needed to separate them. So the author brought up Dove's experience in Germany to talk about why Dove was weirded out by our thing for segregating poetry and fiction. Dove disagrees with separating poetry and fiction. A is talking about genre separation non-overlapping domains, segregate them. But this answer fails to talk about the idea that Dove is incredulous about this. They're saying, oh, this is a trait characteristic of English-speaking societies, but not others like Germany. So they're really trying to get people to pick it by Germany doesn't speak English. B is saying that 
Germany was an experience that reinforced Dove's belief that poetry and fiction don't need to be segregated. So that has both of the ingredients we wanted. Let's keep it. C is talking about Dove's strengths as a writer, but we want to be talking about Dove is incredulous or disagrees with this habit of segregating genres. The other half of this answer has nothing to do with genre segregation. They're just trying to get us to pick something with international because we saw the word Germany. D is saying that this is just a biographical detail, trying to enhance the human interest appeal. That's never been a purpose. Elsa authors don't care if we're interested. E is talking about what Dove believes, and it's talking about her being opposed to genre segregation. So this also has the ingredients we were looking for. Time to crack the case, guys. Okay, they're both talking about genre segregation, but we need to pick one over the other, so what's different about them? Stronger language is always harder to support, and when we look at these two and compare it on that level, the origin is a stronger idea than reinforcing a belief. Let's check on the origin. She grew up reading and loving fiction and poetry, and then she also studied for some time in Germany. That happens later in her life. Germany's not the origin. It seems to mean that B is our correct answer. All right, so let's recap this pattern. We see in the question stem, they're asking us about Germany. Oh, okay, let me go read that sentence about Germany, right? Wrong. When it's local purpose, it's not about the actual detail sentence, it's about the framing idea right before it, or sometimes the takeaway right after it. It's not about the details. Nobody wants to hear about how that rainwater tastes. And oh my God, it tastes like pennies that are sick. It's about why she splashed me, which we'll never know. I have a crush on him and don't know how to express myself. So in that example, they pointed us to Germany, but the correct answer sounded like she's incredulous about segregating the genres. In the previous example, they asked us about the answering machine, and the correct answer sounded a lot like the setup. We're trying to determine the answer to a question. But it also did include some language from the takeaway as well. It was talking about the basic principle. And the basic principle is that whether it's a message you record on your machine or a document you post on your site, you're offering it for distribution. It's not infringing for people to go there and see it. So make sure you zoom out for the wider context. <laughs> zoom out a little bit more. The secret formula for local purpose is that you really want to look at the language of the framing idea right before it, sometimes the takeaway after it. Wrong answers are going to be too strong, make up a purpose, or try to bait you with the detail word, like Germany. Can you remind me again about the other question types? For paragraph purpose, we're looking for rhetorical markers in the first sentence, and we're using abstract language from our framework to find something that matches. The wrong answers are going to be out of scope, describe the wrong paragraph, say something too narrow or too strong. Thanks! And what about... <laughs> meaning in context? Well, there are two types. When it's asking what it refers to, we rewind until we find the callback. Substitute, we try to make up our own word or phrase. The correct answer will correctly describe the referent, or be a word we really could substitute in the same spot. Wrong answers usually play off the dictionary definition, not the meaning in context. So those are the three question types that test the author's intent. What was she doing with this paragraph? What was she doing with this detail? What was she doing with this phrase or word? What are these people doing here? Don't you mean author's intents? <laughs> Remember when I said that earlier? Okay, now it's the worst day of my life. Help me, I'm mine. Well, dragons are gonna dragon, I reckon. That'll do it for today's lesson. Check out our other videos on YouTube, or come visit us at lsatlab.com. See you next time.